Good morning. Good morning. It is great to see you this morning. It's great to be here together to gather as God's people in this place in this time. We are here to grow and make disciples of Jesus Christ, to grow our own faith and to help others as we all travel this journey of faith together. So let's go straight into the, the call of worship this morning, which is found in your bulletin from Psalm 33. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and shield. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Let us pray. O Lord, will your steadfast love please be upon us in this time and in this place as we gather as your people. We are hoping in you. You are our only hope. So we've come to worship you. We've come to give you our minds and our hearts, our bodies and our souls. We wait for you and we know that you are our only help. You are our only shield. So our hearts are glad in you. And Lord, if we are finding a hard time, having a hard time finding our hope in you, will you re-enable our faith this morning? Will you re-energize our spirits by your spirit? Will you please be with us that we might experience you in a fresh and powerful way this morning? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we'll do something a little bit different and we'll sing uh, two hymns together. So let's stand, if you're able, and turn to hymn number 250, Marvelous Grace of Our Loving Lord, and then just a couple pages over from that, when we are finished with that, at 254, What Can Wash Away Our Sins? But let's begin with Marvelous Grace of Our Loving Lord, hymn number 250. <laughs> Yeah. 
the blood of Jesus. Remember that nothing but the blood of Jesus can wash us clean, and he invites us to come to him to be washed clean each day. So we call ourselves and, and call each other to confession as the scriptures call us to confession from Psalm 32, which says, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven. Blessed is the one whose sin is covered. Blessed is the one against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, in whose spirit there is no Deceit. So we look to be blessed. We look to be blessed by the Lord to cover over our sins. So let's take a few moments of silence to confess our individual sins before the Lord at this time. Oh Lord, we do confess that we have fallen short of your glory and your goodness, but we thank you that your grace is far more abundant than even the worst of our sins. Thank you for your forgiveness, that we are assured of forgiveness as we read in your scriptures, which says, when I acknowledge my sin to you, I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Thank you, Lord that you forgive us our sins and make us right with you. Help us to keep on confessing to you so we could
draw ever closer to you each day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take up one more song at this time. It's um, found in your bulletin and the insert, You Are My King, Amazing Love. And let's, we're going to sing the first verse and the second part and then repeat that. Do the third. Hopefully you can catch. I know these songs get a little, you need a roadmap for these songs, but we'll do the first section, the second, and then first and second again, and then the third part and finish up with the second part. So. Let's stand together if you are able and let's sing You Are My King, Amazing Love. our scriptures for this morning from Jonah chapter 3. Uh, we have our insert for you if you would like to follow along there or open up the scriptures as you may have them to Jonah chapter 3 verses 1 through 10. It just went down like a foot. <laughs> Alright, Jonah 3, <clears throat> 1 through 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city these days, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go out to the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, <clears throat> Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on a sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. 
The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with a sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a pro pro proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil ways and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God relented of his disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Thank you. This is the word of the Lord. We, we know that it is true, it is trustworthy, and it will even change our lives as the Spirit moves within us. So we're going to respond by uh, having the offering this morning. If the ushers would please come forward at this time, and we remember that the Lord calls us to give with a cheerful heart. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. If you are here as a guest this morning, uh, please know that the that your your gifts and offerings are welcome, but as you are the members of this church, the Lord is calling to support this work in this time and this place. So let us give the offering to the Lord now. We will be singing uh, the offertory song, Lord, I Need You.
you that you are our God and we are your people. So we respond this morning with thanksgiving and by giving a bit back to you what you have given to us. Will you use these gifts for your kingdom and your purposes here and around the world? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Kids, please come on up. All right, have you ever had the uh, the firemen come to your classroom when you were in school? Did you, did you ever have that happen? The, the firefighters come and tell you about fire safety? Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. yeah. Do you remember what they said? Did they tell you something like, if you ever, like if your clothes ever catch fire, what you should do? Do you remember? It's like, a, it's a cool phrase. Do you remember it? Did they teach you? No? Yes? Don't think about it. Does anybody out around here know what I, what, stop, what the, drop, stop, drop, and roll. Have you heard that before? Right, because if your clothes are on fire, you just don't want them to just stand there. And if you run really fast, maybe it would get worse. So what you do is you stop, if you're standing up, and then you drop on the floor, and you roll, so that, that uh, helps put the fire out. Now, I'm not a, a physicist or whatever. I don't know exactly how that works, but I know it works. So, stop, drop, and roll if you're on fire. Well, why would I be talking about that right now? Because that is, I think, that's kind of a way to think about when we are going the wrong direction, if, if being with God happens to be over in this part of the world, and we don't want to be with God, and we're going the wrong direction, we're going away from God, we're doing bad stuff we shouldn't be doing, the, the Bible calls that sin. If we're going away from God towards sin, well, I think we should take some advice from the firefighters. We stop, and we drop, and instead of rolling, well, some churches would say you roll, but we're not kind of that, that kind of church. Um, we stop, drop, and pray. I was trying to think of something that rhymed with roll or start with an R, but it didn't really work. So stop, drop, and pray. If we're going the wrong way, like I don't know if you heard Rhonda telling the story of, of the Ninevites that Jonah came to talk to, Jonah said, 40 days and your city is going to be destroyed. And they're like, uh, what do we do? Well, they had to stop their evil ways, as it said drop onto their knees and pray to God, saying, God, I'm so sorry for running the wrong way, doing bad stuff, doing evil stuff. I want to turn around and come back to you. Just stop, drop, and pray. Do you want me to try that? You want to do, you want to do it together or just me? All right, I'll just I'll do it myself. So, we're going this way, you know. Our, 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 our good relationship with God is over here, right? And doing stuff that we shouldn't be doing is over here. So we're going the wrong way. Well, what do you do? You, when God's Spirit speaks to you, maybe through the Scriptures or maybe through somebody uh, who's helping you learn about God's ways, say, oh no, I'm doing the wrong thing. I need to, I need to stop, drop, and pray. That's what I have for you this morning. You have any thoughts for us? No, that's fine. You can think about that. Well, let me pray for us, and then you can head off to Sunday school, all right? Dear Father, thank you that you give us lots of chances. You give us second chances and even more than that. So, Lord, when we are wandering from you, help us to stop. And help us to drop to our knees and to pray to you so that we wouldn't go the wrong way and be separated from you, and that we would come and be close to you like you would have us to be. So I pray for, for the kids here and the kids in this church and the families and the adults and everyone here, that we would all come back to you more and more. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, kids, thanks for coming up. We'll see you soon. And Katie.
Katie. Can we all uh, welcome Katie back? Katie's uh, a college student at the Baptist College, and she's back for the semester. So I'm told my color is messed up. <laughs> the guitar straps will do that every time. Uh, so we're very thankful that Katie is back to be our Sunday school teacher for the year. And we've got some exciting new curriculum on the way, so uh, bring your kids, whoever they are, in your, in your circles. So we're excited for a new school year. Well, at this time, let's uh, pray with and for each other. What are the things that we can be praying for? The Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, please turn with me to your scriptures. Uh, I've got the insert for you. I don't know where I put mine, but I think I'll be okay without it. Um, we're looking at Jonah chapter 3 this morning, so please... Uh, Open your scriptures or turn, open the insert, if you will, and let us look at Jonah chapter 3 together. Excuse me there. We already looked at Jonah chapter 1 and 2, and um, you know, Jonah's a, a relatively famous story of the prophet who was not such a good prophet. He was running the other way. God cornered him by having him swallowed, be swallowed by a giant fish. And then he prayed a, a what I'm proposing, a somewhat lame prayer of repentance. And then he was spit back up on the land. And now God is giving him uh, his proverbial second chance. So as we look at what, what does it look like to repent? You know, Jesus used this word repent, and uh, the scriptures use this word repent, which means basically turn around. And Jonah is calling the people to turn around. Uh, Jonah himself was called to turn around. Uh, and maybe this morning we too are being called to turn around. It's, it's a little bit like if you're in your house, you're watching TV or surfing the net or whatever, and somebody calls and says, hey, there's a gas leak. Okay, that, yeah, that's a problem. Okay, there's a gas leak and there is down power lines. So we've got lots of gas everywhere and we've got sparks everywhere. And you're just watching the TV and like, yeah, whatever, that's fine. And they're like, you know, it's, you're just giving me the news from like across town, right? I'm like, well, no, there's a gas leak and the down power lines uh, right next door. Um, okay, that, 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 you're kind of ratcheting up the, the urgency here, right? Somebody is giving you some information that really needs your response. And sometimes God sends His Holy Spirit to do just that to us. Hey, you might think you're doing okay today, you're just hanging out, but there is a dangerous situation that you need to respond to. And that's what was happening with, uh, with Jonah and with the Ninevites. And so Jonah delivered the short, what, what, I've been, what I've heard called, and I will share with you, the shortest and vaguest sermon in the history of all sermons. This is the shortest sermon ever. It's five words in Hebrew, and I think in our English translation it's like seven or eight words, right? Five word sermon, and it's very vague. All he says is, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. Now, he leaves out any mention of God. He leaves out any mention of grace, no repentance, no forgiveness, just you're all going to die, and I'm going to pop some popcorn, go up on the hill, and watch it happen. <laughs> Which we learned in chapter 4. We'll get to that later. It's not a very cheery or helpful sermon, is it? You're going to die. See you later. Um, he could, you know, you could sort of figure, okay, maybe he said something more than that. Uh, but the text doesn't really say that, so we don't really know exactly if he said more than that. Maybe, but we're told the bottom line of what happened, though. And this gives me, as a, as a, a relatively new preacher, gives me a lot of comfort. He gave the lamest sermon ever, and the revival just, boom, broke out. The whole town. Like, well, okay, God, 
It's not, it's not really about the preacher. It's about God's spirit moving in people. And some miraculous way, God's spirit moved in this town and we, we later learned is 120,000 people in this town. Oh, by the way, it's probably the greatest uh, city of that time. This is probably like the greatest city of that era. And the most evil city of only one in history as far as the atrocities that they've committed. But what is the bottom line of what happened? And the people of Nineveh believed God. Now some of us, if you hear the story of Jonah, I've mentioned this before, like, I don't know if I can really believe the story of Jonah. I mean, come on, that's not very scientific. Well, you may have a point there, but we can say that's not even the biggest miracle in the book of Jonah. The biggest miracle in the book of Jonah is God uses a five-word sermon to change a whole city and its inhabitants. They believed God. They moved from unbelief to belief. They moved from going their own way, which, re which resulted in all sorts of mess, to believing God. Now, it doesn't say they believed Jonah. It doesn't say they, they held a Bible study. It doesn't say anything like that. It just says they believed God. And, you know, if you look at Jonah's little mini sermon, he says, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. Right? The whole city is just going to be a heap of rubble. And maybe they took that as, you know, enemies are going to come and ransack them or something. But they were going to be overthrown. But God, later we see that God, well, I don't want to give away the ending. Well, we read it already, so I'll give away the ending. Uh, God changed his mind in some sense, or God, what does it say? God relented from the disaster he would do to them. He said, okay, it's, since you have repented, you are no longer going to be overthrown, but you will be overturned. So when we repent, we move from being under threat of being overthrown to being overturned. And so we're, we're changed. So they realized they were on fire, or just about to be at least. And they did what the firefighters tell you in kindergarten class. Stop, drop, and roll. They stopped they dropped and they prayed to God. And Jesus, he really preached something similar. He said, which I had at the top of the bulletin this morning, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of the gospel is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. He doesn't even say 40 days. He says, now is the time. Believe the good news. Stop going away from God. Drop what you're doing, which is separating you from God. And... Pray to God and turn back to God. So their beliefs, they say when they believe God, they stop believing the wrong thing and they start believing the right thing. They believed God. So their, their beliefs were, were overthrown. And I proposed to you this morning, this is kind of my, my thesis statement, overthrown beliefs are leading to overturned actions and overturned lives. So we see the kind of the progression that we have with the people here. Their beliefs were overturned. And then later, that, just not even later, almost right away, leads to overturned actions. They changed their beliefs, and their actions were overturned. So we look here at uh, verse 5. The people believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth. That's basically uh, like burlap, but even worse. That's, that's how they uh, showed their repentance in that culture. From the greatest of them to the least of them. They were mourning and they were fasting. They were lamenting. They were crying out to God. They were putting on these things to show their hearts. They had outward action to show their inward change of heart. But they didn't just stop at this, these religious symbols. They realized their beliefs were wrong. They realized that their actions were wrong. They were doing evil. They were committing violence. They called each other to true repentance. They turned from the violence that they were doing... From top to bottom, the king on down to and even the animals. They, I mean, I just get a chuckle when I read that. Like, okay, the animals have to fast too. The animals have to, like, you know, I'm an animal guy. Um, we just got a bunch more chickens and we just <laughs> built a coop. And, you know, we our family is an animal family. So um, I just think it's funny that the animals repented 
better than Jonah did. I think we're supposed to really compare as we go along. There's lots of things that we can learn and grow in this story. But we're supposed to compare, hey, Jonah, the supposed man of God, it took like two amazing miracles, this hurricane and this fish, to get him to repent. And you got these supposedly evil people. They were evil people. They used to skin their enemies alive and do all these horrible things. They were legendarily horrible. And five words and they repent. And the animals do. It's, I mean, it's funny. It's almost absurd how quickly they have responded to God's call compared to Jonah. The real change wasn't just in their minds and hearts, but in their, in their lives. It made a real difference in their day-to-day -day lives. They, they stopped the evil that they were doing. They stopped the violence that we were doing. We, we see in the news today all sorts of violence and threats of violence. And it can be easy to say, well, those people, those are the violent people out there. Well, Jesus says, the violence in our hearts is the moral equivalent of the violence of our actions. Jesus said, you, you've heard it said, do not murder, but if you have hate in your heart for someone, that is murdering them. That's the Sermon on the Mount. Well, I don't know about you, but this week, I know that I've had violence in my heart. Somebody does something I don't like or want, and I just... See, I'm a, I'm a what, we, what sometimes they call an internal processor, so I don't necessarily let it out, but it just, it's all up here, and it's all in here, right? And some of us are internal processors, some of us are external processors, some of us can do some of each, but I can let it stew here, and I can look nice and shiny on the outside, but guess what? There's still evil in my heart that I, too, need to repent of. So, the people believed in God and it changed their lives. Now, do, do we believe in God? Do you believe in God? Do you trust God more and more? Well, then, how has it shown in your life? The old saying goes, what have you done recently just because you love God? Or what have you stopped doing recently just because you love God? Has your overturned beliefs resulted in overturned actions. Now, each step along the way, they believed God, they, they showed outward signs of repentance, they, their overturned actions, all of that is a miracle. Now, don't think, well, okay, if I believe God, I'll t I, then the rest is up to me. No, it's all God's Spirit working the whole time. Whether our own internal violence or external violence is, is aggressive or passive or we, we participate in systemic violence, we all, according to Jesus, have something to repent of. And that will lead to, thirdly, our overturned lives. Now famously, God gives Jonah a second chance, right? Jonah did the exact opposite of what he's supposed to do, and God gives him a second chance. God gives the Ninevites a second chance. God gives me, God gives you a second chance. So the question is, are we going to be overthrown as the kingdoms of ourselves that we continually build up one way or another? Is the kingdom of me going to be overthrown, or is it going to be overturned? Overthrown sounds a little more dangerous than overturned. God's, God's glory, as the scriptures call it, God's amazingness, God's beauty, God's wonderfulness is so much more amazing in mind and heart exploding than we can ever imagine. So, He's so perfect and good, He has every right to look at the kingdom of me and say, I need to overthrow that. He has the every right to look at the kingdom of, of us, of you, on your own, and say, that needs to be overthrown. God has every right to come to Jonah and say, you need to change. God has every right to come to the Ninevites and say, you need to change. Now, the Ninevites were legendarily evil. Jonah was not that much better. He supposedly knew better. But he shook his fist at God, right? 
He was a racist who thought that those people over there deserve to go to hell. That's basically what he was saying, right? God's saying, I want to save them, I want to love them. And Jonah says, too bad, I think they go to hell, I'm smarter than you. Jonah didn't know God's grace, but God kept pursuing him. And God kept pursuing the Ninevites. God kept he's pursuing. Do you think, well, do you think Jonah ultimately repented? If we read the rest of the story, we'll finish the story next week. Jonah is still a jerk. <laughs> Jonah's still a big fat jerk in chapter 4. So we're kind of left hanging. Uh, is, is Jonah a good guy or a bad guy? How many chances do you think God gives? I'm really glad that God gives lots of chances. He doesn't always give lots of chances. But he often does. So what about you? What about me? What part of you? Now let's not focus on everything, but focus on what's one thing maybe the Holy Spirit is trying to tug at you saying, all right, this needs to be overthrown. This part of the kingdom of you needs to be overthrown today. Because this part of the kingdom of you is separating you from God today. And God doesn't want to be separated from you. He's, that's why he came to die for you. So you can be closer and closer to God and live out who you really should be. What part of you needs to be overthrown today? We have a handy guide in the, in the scriptures. Uh, it's found in Exodus 20. It's called the Ten Commandments. What part of you needs to be overthrown today? Well, the Ten Commandments say there's no other gods before me. There's no idols. There's honor your father and mother. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't, don't lie. Don't covet. Don't do just, and then we go later in the scriptures, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with our God. What is the thing in your life today that's causing separation from God? It's, it's very common in our culture. It's very common in our culture to look over things that, that separate us from God. Like using the Lord's name in vain, for, for example. Saying, OMG, so to speak. Or, that's a small thing. Well, we can think from our perspective. That's a small thing. That's not a big deal. But God says clearly, honor my name. That's one example. You know, treating each other harshly. That's, Jesus said that's a form of murder. What are those things in our life? What's the thing? You can even just take a moment of quiet and say, Holy Spirit, show me what is separating me from God right now. And give me the strength. Help me to stop and drop to my knees and pray to you. Thanks be to God that he doesn't show us this all at once and we would probably die of a heart attack or aneurysm. Because he is gracious with us. He brings us along one step at a time. Now the, the Ninevites repent. The, clearly the Ninevites repent, but does Jonah? Does, does Do you? Do I? Some days yes, some days no. But sometimes the Spirit breaks through even the hardest of hearts. Now, do you realize, do I realize, do we all realize that if you go your own way without trusting God, you will be overthrown? Now, when, when Jonah said, in 40 days the city's going to be overthrown, that sounded like a promise. That was more like a threat and it was more, actually more of a warning. So God gives us a warning too. And a warning is helpful because if there's a gas leak in down power lines, you want that warning. Here's the difference between us and the Ninevites though. We have one pretty amazing difference. Did you, did you notice um, the beginning of verse 9? The king says, who knows? Maybe God will relent and turn from his fierce anger. He doesn't know. He doesn't know what God is going to do. We, we, on the other hand, who are in Christ, who can read the scriptures and who the Spirit can teach us in our hearts, we know. We don't have to say who knows. Because Jesus died for our sins. And he promises, if you repent and come to me, you will be forgiven. So even when we think of this kind of this weighty thing of what, what's holding me back, we still have a chance to give thanks and say, 
yes, Lord, thank you so much. You can overturn my life. I'm tired of building the kingdom of me. I want to live for your kingdom. Maybe your life is overturned and being more and more overturned. God gives second and third and fourth and umpteenth chances. If we are in Christ, we are forgiven ultimately. And thanks be to God for that. But there are still those things of the kingdom of me that God wants to tear down so we can be closer and closer to Him. If you have not yet given your life to, to Jesus, not, not let say, yes, Lord, you are the King of heaven and earth, and I am sorry for running away from you, for doing all these things. Please forgive me. That's your entrance into the kingdom of God, where you can turn from the kingdom of you. So instead of being overthrown, ultimately, you can be overturned and have new life. So brothers and sisters and friends, let's, let's give thanks to God that the true God of heaven and earth loves you so much that he wants to give you more and more chances. On our own, we stand destined to be overthrown, but God gives us the chance to be overturned instead through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Jesus, his, when he died on the cross, he, in a sense, was overthrown. He was lifted up and crashed down so we could be lifted up. Turn to Jesus, perhaps for the first time, perhaps for the thousandth time, to live out the overturned beliefs, the overturned actions, the overturned lives that you've been given. We've been given God's grace so we can lead overturned lives. Will you come to him more and more today? He loves you so much. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you that you love us so much that you give us more than one chance. And we ask you, Lord, to continue to work in our hearts. Lord, maybe we have faith in you that you have given us for many years. Or maybe we're not there yet. Or maybe we're somewhere in between. But help us to turn from our own way and to turn back to your way more and more and more. Thank you that you had mercy on the Ninevites, you had mercy on Jonah, and that you have mercy on us because of Jesus. So would you please impress these things on our hearts and on our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please stay with me and let's conclude our service by... Let's see, I don't have my bulletin. Uh, 434, according to the hymn thingy. What's, what's, what's the name of the song? What a, what a friend we have in Jesus. One of my favorites. That's probably why I picked it. Uh, 434. What a friend we have in Jesus. Please stand if you're able. And let's conclude our service with this song.
benediction from the word of the Lord. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen.